Hello and welcome to the Future of Healthcare Conference. My name is Hafiz Nadiri and I'm a member of the Aga Khan Health Board. I hope you're all keeping well. I hope you're all keeping safe. It's so exciting to see delegates join us today from across the world as we take a glimpse into the future healthcare horizon. The COVID-19 pandemic has been the greatest modern day challenge to healthcare systems around the world. So it felt right to hold this conference at this time. In many ways, the COVID era has made the world a smaller place. And with healthcare taking center stage, there has been more scope to share knowledge and ideas. Technology has played a key role in helping us to connect and we have witnessed its use accelerate in the healthcare sector. In today's conference, we are privileged to have international experts to shed light on important aspects of healthcare. We'll begin with a keynote address, which will allow us to explore precision medicine, what it means and how it's relevant to the future of healthcare. You will then be admitted into your pre-selected breakout rooms where you will explore an important aspect of healthcare such as research and the potential of stem cell therapy, non-communicable diseases with lifestyle medicine, exploring the future of cancer care or mental health services, as well as cybersecurity in the virtual world. We'll be recording all these sessions in each breakout room. So you will have the opportunity to listen to the other talks as they will be distributed on a platform after the conference. Be sure to stay till the end after the breakout sessions, as we will have a presentation about health communication, which has never been so important as it is today. So before we begin with the talks, we wanted to get your thoughts and feelings about the future of healthcare. We wanted this to be as interactive as possible, so please do participate in the polls. So on your screen, you will see the poll questions appear in a moment. And be sure to scroll down. There are three questions on the poll. And um, the first question is we wanted to get a feeling of how you felt the future of healthcare was relevant to you. So um, this is a multiple choice. It's all anonymous. And we'll be sharing results at the end. The second question is about how you felt about the COVID era. Is it an opportunity for innovation in healthcare? And finally, we're interested to see how hopeful you were about the future of healthcare. So we're just going to allow the delegates a few more seconds to fill in that poll and we'll be interested to see the result. Glad to see lots of you already participating. Almost 50% of participants have given their opinion. Great to see that. And already we're seeing a diverse, diverse outcome. So thank you for all those who participated. And um, it's interesting to see that many felt being informed about the future of healthcare was important to them. And glad to see that the majority of people um, felt that the COVID era was an opportunity for innovation and looks like most of you felt hopeful about the future of healthcare. We'll be doing a similar poll at the end of the conference. Um, so feel, please do stay till the end because we'll be interested to see how your opinions may have changed in the course of the conference. So we're now going to have opening remarks made by chairman of the Aga Khan Health Board UK, Akbar Dala. So Chairman, over to you. Thank you, Hafiz. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I am really pleased to see so many joining our conference today. The inspiration for which came 15 months ago when I attended a presentation at the Aga Khan Center in London, given by Professor Al Nasir Lalani from the Aga Khan University in Pakistan on how advances in medical technology in this case, in his field of stem cell biology, will have a profound economic and societal impact in the continuing evolution of humankind. Later, I was put in contact with Professor Samunir Pir Muhammad and learned of his pioneering work in precision medicine. 
Other professionals shared their work with the health board in their specialized fields. Dr. Shara is merchant in the field of oncology and advances in immunotherapy. Dr. Shireen Qasim on hematology and plant-based nutrition. Dr. Asif Bachlani in psychiatry and mental health. And Irfan Hemani on the UK's cybersecurity policy in an era where health has arguably become a global security issue and we have unprecedented threats to our privacy. Blazing a trail in medicine is of course not new. It has been a continual process through the ages. This week, the UK government launched its genomic strategy. And every day we use technology we couldn't have dreamt of 10 or even five years ago. But the demands placed on societies by the demographics of our population is a driver for the transformation that technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, and even 5G will bring to both physical and mental health care. Who could have imagined a few years ago that a machine was actually analyzing your CT scan or that appointments with your doctor would almost all be done virtually? This technology will not replace medics. It will create jobs and allow medics to do far more for their patients. Worries about robots taking over come from images of Star Trek. It is highly unlikely. In isolation though, it cannot shape the future. Other societal challenges of social inequality, of jobs, of an aging population in the West and a growing younger one in other parts of the world will also impact. But when developed around a framework of standards, of rules, ethically, justly, with global collaboration, it will enrich quality of life. Let us reflect that globally, non-communicable diseases are responsible for 70% of all deaths. A third of these deaths occur in those aged 30 to 69. And 80% of these premature deaths occur in low and middle income countries. So it is equally important that the fruits of these advances are widely shared across all societies. Ultimately, we will ourselves prioritize staying healthier for longer, moving healthcare from an episodic service to a lifelong process of managing good health. This more engaged health consumer will place a greater focus on preventive health. The growth of wellness programs shows this behavior in action as people will want to live better rather than just longer lives. In all of this, the Health Board wanted to bring together some of the amazing work of our scientists, medical and healthcare professionals to the attention of the wider Jamaat and articulated in a way that visualizes for us all the realms of the possible as we age gracefully. So who better to close off this conference than Zane Vergy, a journalist and now also an entrepreneur with her own communications business, joining us from Los Angeles to help us absorb some of the messages that give us hope in these testing times. The pandemic not only reinforces the vital roles of people who provide healthcare and other essential services, it also underpins the importance of medical science and innovation and its contribution to people's livelihoods and physical and mental health. Moreover, it demonstrates how global communities come together to break barriers, bring shared learnings, and find opportunities through common adversity. But of course, to tell the full story of the future of healthcare cannot justifiably be covered in one session. So this is the start of a journey that we can continue to tell in our next normal, whatever that will look like. I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you and Ya Ali Madad. Thank you, Chairman. Our keynote address today is by Professor Sir Munir Pir Mohammed, who is a consultant physician at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital. He is the director of the Medical Research Council Centre for Drug Safety Sciences and director of the Wolfson Centre for Personalised Medicine. He is an inaugural NIHR senior investigator, fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK, commissioner on human medicines, and is a non-executive director of NHS England, 
and has been appointed as president of the British Pharmacological Society. He was awarded a Knight's Bachelor in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2015. His research focuses on personalised medicine, clinical pharmacology and drug safety. Such a pleasure to have you at the conference. Um, so Manil, the floor is yours. Please start when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So it may be good morning for some of you uh, in different parts of the world. Thank you very much uh, for asking me to give this talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to my family members who may be online listening to me. I hope to be able to see you soon once the madness of this pandemic uh, is over. So I've been asked to give you a talk on precision medicine. What is it and why is it important? I'm gonna keep it at a very high level um, because there are people with different types of expertise uh, online, uh, but I'm happy to discuss things in more detail offline with individuals who may be interested in certain things that I say. So um, let's just move the slides on. Okay, so we know that one size does not fit all. When you go to a clothes shop and you want to buy some clothes, you're gonna buy clothes which fit you. You're not gonna buy clothes which are big for you or small for you. Um, and that's what we should be doing in medicine. Uh, we know, and we've known for a long time that uh, one size does not fit all. In fact, the, uh, the, one of the few people, first people who actually said that was William Oslow, who was a famous physician uh, from the 19th century. He said that the variability is the law of life. No two faces are the same, no two bodies are alike, and no two individuals relax, uh, react alike. And if individuals have the same disease, um, the disease is probably different in those two individuals. So if you have asthma, your asthma will be different from the asthma in your neighbor. But at the moment, the way we practice medicine is we treat disease in the same way. Similarly, uh, we dose people often in the same way, as in one dose fits all. Uh, we know that different people require different doses. Um, and the higher the dose, the more likely you are to get toxicity from that dose. And Paracelsus, who was a famous physician uh, in the 15th century, basically said that poison is in everything, nothing is without poison, and dose is what makes it either a remedy or poison. And what we want to do is to make sure that people get the right dose so that they can get the best outcomes for their particular disease. Similarly, what we have now is a pandemic of uh, an epidemic of obesity. Um, this is one of the biggest killers uh, in the world. Um, and clearly prevention becomes really important in terms of trying to prevent obesity. Uh, we need to be able to lose weight uh, so we remain healthier for longer. However, at the moment, the preventive approaches to obesity in terms of diet, exercise, are all the same. Everybody uses the same type of methods. We need to be able to think about how we can personalize those methods. So what, as a doctor, we try to personalize things for you. I work as a doctor in the National Health Service. And when I see a patient uh, in my clinic, I'll do the best things for that patient. I will use my clinical judgment. I'll use evidence that is there from clinical trials and think that this is the best drug for that patient in front of me uh, in the clinic. Unfortunately, what I'm doing is using data from uh, 2000 patients in clinical trials to that individual patient in front of me in the clinic. And that is, uh, that works to some extent, but it is relatively unsophisticated. It can't predict whether the patient will respond to the first drug I give them. And I can't predict whether the patient will develop side effects from that drug. Um, and for example, with depression, what we do at the moment is treat patients with antidepressant. Um, we have to wait for six months to see whether that antidepressant has worked. In many cases, it doesn't work. So you have to try the second antidepressant. If that doesn't work, you have to try the third antidepressant. So it takes sometimes 12 months before you find the right drug. But just imagine if we could use technology to find the right drug um, for the first time. And really the mantra of precision medicine is to have the right treatment at the right dose for the right patient at the right time. And the first time really, so you get the best outcomes for the patient uh, in terms of efficacy, uh, better outcomes uh, and, and better uh, healthier lifestyles for the future. So what we really need to do is to think about how we can progress that. What can we use to really progress that? And His Highness Aga Khan basically said that in his quote here. Um, and 
what we are beginning to use in medicine is to use differences, diversity as an opportunity rather than a threat. People have looked at it as a threat, but actually the diversity that we have within the world's populations, but diversity we, we have within our own population can be used in order to be able to develop precision medicine. And this is really an opportunity. And this is what people are doing with precision medicine. Now, Barack Obama, in his uh, State of the Union address a year before he finished his presidency, uh, gave a definition of precision medicine. He said, it's an emerging approach for disease treatment Really, so treatment is what I'm going to talk to you about mostly, but it is also an important uh, emerging approach for prevention. Uh, preventive techniques are going to be really important in the future, and prevention is always better than cure. And how can we actually uh, develop precision medicine? Well, we need to take account of individual variability. Uh, we need to take account of individual variability in the genetics, genes, the environment, where you live, how many people live with, and your lifestyle. You smoke, how much you eat, how much exercise you undertake. All of those things are really important for us to be able to move things forward. I'm going to I'm going to show you where we've got to. It's good. It's very complicated, but there are lots of strides go, uh, in that are happening. Um, and we can't fly right now, but we are learning uh, to get there. Uh, we started very slowly, uh, you know, from crawling to walking uh, to running, um, and then eventually we'll be able to fly. But we are moving forward, and there's been great progress over the last 10 years. Um, and I'll show you some of that progress. I can't show you everything. I only have a short time, uh, but, but there has been a lot of progress. I'm gonna to talk to two particular areas. Uh, one is about sensors and the other is about genomics, but there are many other areas of precision medicine I could talk to you about. Um, and maybe at another time I can tell you about those other areas of precision medicine. So what is a sensor? A sensor is a device uh, which detects or measures a physical property and re records, indicates, or otherwise responds to it. So all of you, uh, most of you will have smartphones, an iPhone or an Android phone, and those phones have sensors. They can count the number of steps you take. They can uh, uh, understand when you're actually climbing flight of stairs. So the sensors are very important in that particular phone. The car that you drive has many sensors on board. It, it monitors your speed, it monitors the tire pressure, it monitors the amount of uh, petrol that you have uh, in your fuel tank. Um, and, and the car has about 100 sensors um, and you'll have 200 uh, in the near future. But we haven't really used sensors at all very much in medicine, but this is now coming along and sensors are gonna be one aspect of precision medicine as we uh, move along uh, in terms of the future of healthcare. So I'm gonna give you two examples of that. One uh, is an adherence sensor. When doctors prescribe medicines to patients, patients are told to take them regularly according to the instructions, but we know that many people don't take the medicines as prescribed, and that's called non-adherence. Um, and, and that unfortunately leads to poor outcomes for patients as well, because if they're not taking the drugs, uh, they're not going to uh, improve those from those particular drugs. So people are thinking about how can we actually understand what people take and so on. Um, and people have developed this thing called an adherence sensor. It's a small sensor which you can embed within the tablet. Um, you put it in the tablet. When the patient takes the tablet, uh, it goes into your stomach. And as soon as it hits the acidity of your stomach, the sensor lets out a signal. The signal goes onto a patch that's onto, on, on your front arm, on, on your upper arm, um, and records uh, is on a computer saying that you've taken your tablet at this particular time. At the same time, it'll record your heart rate. And using these kind of sensors, one can tell when you've taken tablets, when you've taken too many tablets, or you haven't taken enough tablets, um, and also how you're feeling at the time as well. So it gives you a real-time assessment of what's happening when people are taking uh, medicines. Another sensor that is becoming increasingly uh, important are wearables such as uh, the Apple Watch, for example, other types of watches. The Apple Watch can uh, uh, count your heart rate uh, and gives you a full assessment over 24 hours or during sleep of your heart rate, the number of steps you take, the noise that you're exposed to, and how well you sleep at night. Um, recently, Apple have introduced something that actually allows you to sort of count how long you take to wash your hands, 20 seconds, remember, for, uh, for the COVID pandemic. I will count down the 20 seconds for you. It will automatically detect running water and the fact that you're washing your hands. And, and it can also um, 
check your ECG. Uh, this is my ECG that I took with my Apple Watch. You can see, fortunately, it's normal, uh, but, but uh, it, it can detect when people have abnormal rhythms and can warn them. And you can then share your ECG with your doctor saying that, you know, I have an abnormal rhythm. And these kind of uh, wearables are going to be increasingly important in terms of how we actually practice medicine in the future. And this is all part of precision medicine. Let me move on to genomics. So what is genomics? Well, genomics is a study of a person's genes, of all the person's genes. Uh, in the human body, there are 22,000 genes. Um, and what we can do with the genome by understanding genome is understand how the genes work, but also how the genes interact with each other, but also how the genes interact with the person's environment. And all that is really important to determine how you're going to develop disease, whether you're going to develop disease, what severity of disease, but also in relation to how you're going to respond uh, to drugs. And the building block of genomics is DNA, deoxyribonucleotide uh, acid. Nucleoside acid. Um, and, and DNA, the structure of it was uh, identified in 1953 by Watson Crick. And if you look at one cell uh, and you take the DNA in one cell, uh, it measures about two meters long if you stretch it from end to end. And if you take all the DNA in all the cells of your body, uh, the total amount of DNA in your body would stretch to 744 million miles. That is uh, to the moon and back 1500 times or to the sun and back four times. So there's an enormous amount of information held in your cells. And DNA is the most fantastic uh, uh, engineering uh, piece of equipment that we, anybody has ever uh, uh, devised. And it uh, holds so much information that determines how we respond to all sorts of uh, insults that are thrown at our body. You may think this is not really important to me. So I'm gonna give you two examples where I can tell you how important it is. So some of you uh, may like cooking and may like asparagus. Um, and uh, sometimes when you eat asparagus, some people can smell a funny odor uh, in their urine. And Benjamin Franklin said that uh, gives urine a disagreeable odor. Um, and we know that 58% of men and 61% of women can't smell uh, the uh, uh, disagreeable odor in the urine after having eaten um, asparagus. Um, and the reason uh, why uh, asparagus sometimes causes a disagreeable odor is because it, it's broken down into sulfated metabolites. And you can smell that, some people can smell that. Um, and people who can smell that have uh, um, a, a gene called olfactory receptor 2. Those who can't may have a particular variation in that gene and they can't actually smell that. So it tells you that even what we like sometimes in terms of eating and taste uh, is also determined by our genes as well. Similarly, uh, if you look at uh, handedness, are you, uh, most people are right-handed, but uh, some people are left-handed. And there are 41 genes that determine the fact that you are left-handed. Um, some people are ambidextrous, ambidextrous uh, they can use both hands to be able to write and the seven genes determine ambidexterity. So based on that, what we have found over the last uh, 10, 15 years is that genetics is really important in the way uh, people interact with the environment and that increases the risk of certain diseases, but also how genes can determine how we respond to medicines. And that's certainly uh, been shown within COVID-19 as well. We're going through an unprecedented time at the moment, a once in a hundred year pandemic, uh, which has unfortunately killed about a million people worldwide. And certain communities have been more affected than other communities. Through the work that's been done over the last six months, COVID-19 is a new disease. We've learned an awful lot over the last six months, but we're still learning an awful lot uh, at the moment. Um, we know that um, men, um, are at higher risk of severe disease from COVID-19. If you're older, you're at higher risk. Um, uh, Asian, uh, our community is at higher risk. Black people are at higher risk. And if you're obese, you're at higher risk. If you have type 2 diabetes, if you're higher risk and hypertension as well. And if you combine these factors, that increases the risk in terms of severe disease, unfortunately, uh, poor outcome from COVID-19. We also begin to identify the genetic factors that determine where some people get severe disease. Um, a paper, two papers which appeared in Science last week showed some uh, problems with the interferon pathway, which predispose individuals to getting severe disease associated with COVID. And there are other genetic factors which have been identified. 
We've known about genetic factors in many diseases and cancer is certainly one of the diseases. I know that you have a longer um, talk on cancer later on. So I'll just show one slide on cancer. Um, cancer is a genetic disease. Unfortunately, when people develop cancer, they have two genomes in the body. One is the genome that they're born with and one is the genome of the cancer. Um, the genome of the cancer is derived from the genome that you were born with, but unfortunately, small changes occur in that genome and you, you develop the cancer genome, which then leads to progression of the cancer and eventually to metastases, and unfortunately, it kills some people. So if you look at this particular um, scan, it's called a positron emission tomography scan, a PET scan for short, and this patient has malignant melanoma, metastatic malignant melanoma. And the uh, spots that you can see on the scan before, uh, uh, before treatment are metastases where the tumor has spread from the skin to the bone marrow, uh, to, to the liver uh, and various other places. And so people were able to take this particular um, tumor. They were able to sequence it and, and look at the um, uh, DNA within that uh, particular sequence. They were ident able to identify mutations in one particular gene, which is called BRAF and they were able to develop a drug for that particular gene. Um, and when the patient was given the drug, uh, two weeks later, the tumor had completely disappeared. And this is called targeted therapy, precision therapy. Uh, and this is, now being, uh, uh, this is now available for many different types of cancer. Unfortunately, in this particular patient and many types of cancer, um, it comes back after six months because cancer is an extremely complex biological disease. And people are now trying combinations of drugs, not only targeted therapies, but combinations of targeted therapies, but also immune therapies, which you will hear about later on, which help in terms of providing a long-term durable sustained response. What about the dose of drugs? How can we uh, try to personalize the dose of drugs? So let me take an example of warfarin. Some of you may be on warfarin or may have relatives who are on warfarin. Warfarin is a blood thinner. It is there to prevent or treat clots. But the dose that's required by an individual varies between half a milligram a day to 20 milligrams per day, so 40-fold variation. We've identified uh, through work that we've undertaken throughout the world that there are two genes which determine the dose that's required. We can now analyze for those genes in about 40 minutes and actually then use an algorithm to tell you what is the best dose for you when you start uh, the warfarin. It's no good later on, once you've already been in warfarin, it's when you start the warfarin that you can actually utilize that. And this new technology is coming into play uh, in healthcare uh, now and, and in the near future. Unfortunately, sometimes drugs cause serious side effects. Here's a patient that I looked after who had something called toxic epidermal necrolysis, where they took a drug within two weeks, their skin sloughed off um, and, and they were in ITU for six weeks. Um, and this is a very rare phenomenon. It occurs in about one in a million patients per year. And these medicines can sometimes cause serious side effects. Um, we were able to study this particular patient and show that they had a genetic factor which predisposed them to this developing this serious side effect. We can now analyze people's genes before they go on drugs and then uh, don't give them the drug uh, if they have a predisposing factor and give them a different drug to prevent these serious side effects. So that's precision medicine again in action. As Akbar mentioned, uh, we are uh, living longer. Um, and unfortunately, at the moment, we are living longer with many diseases. Um, I, free, uh, I frequently see patients with five, six diseases taking 15 drugs. But what we need to think about is how we can develop medicine so that we need to grow older, healthier, but also grow um, older in a much more graceful fashion. So we have a healthier lifestyle. We can enjoy our old, old age. Um, and live in the community rather than constantly, constantly being admitted to hospital. So we need to think about ways of being able to prevent ill health and precision medicine will certainly uh, be really important in terms of allowing us to be able to do that. And as I said, really important for us to be able to look at the diversity, not only within our population, but diversity between different populations. Um, we know that in the human genome, there are 3 billion letters 99.9% uh, is exactly the same across the whole of the global population, irrespective of where you were born, you know, the color of your skin. 
but 0.1% is different, even within uh, the same uh, communities. 0.1%, you may say, is not very much, but 0.1% of 3 billion is 3 million bases, which gives you an enormous amount of variation, and that determines, to some extent, our height, our hair color, how soon we go gray, etc. So the genetic tests that are being developed um, will be useful for all populations. But it's really important to remember that if I develop a genetic test uh, in a northern European population, it may not necessarily be relevant for a genetic test, for the same genetic test in an Indian population or in a black population. So it is really important for all of us, irrespective of what community we come from, to take part in research. So that when we develop genetic tests, they are available for everybody in the world, not just for the rich populations. They're available for poor populations, for anybody with any different, degree, uh, different type of skin color, um, for whichever country they come from. And that's really important that we develop tests for everybody uh, rather than for select populations, because by doing it for select populations, what you are going to do is to be able to increase health inequalities and racial disparities. And one thing that is very, very important uh, is to make sure that we develop uh, precision medicine and in an equitable manner uh, for the whole world population without uh, increasing uh, disparities. So last two slides from me. Um, so I just want to let us summarize that uh, we've come quite far so far over the last um, decade or so, but still got a lot of work to do, an enormous amount of work to do. When we succeeded um, and, and developed the precision therapies and precision diagnostic tests that we are developing, we'll be able to detect disease much early and try to uh, prevent the serious complications of disease detection late. We'll be able to prevent disease and we'll be able to give prognostic biomarkers or tests. We tell, how, uh, tell individuals how severe the disease is gonna be so we can actually then develop uh, intensities of therapy at the beginning. We are developing new precision therapies as, as, as I've already shown you, but we can also improve existing therapies as I've shown you with warfarin. What we want to do is to really improve the overall efficacy of all the treatments we give and reduce the side effects of the drugs that we use. And we want to do this without bankrupting the healthcare system. And we want to do this in an equitable manner without increasing health inequalities or racial disparities. And that is really important. So what's going to happen uh, in the next 50 years? So I think um, if you look at where we are at the moment, um, uh, we are at the stage of iPhone 11, I think. So if I uh, am right in terms of my calculations, in 50 years time, people will have the iPhone 36. Um, I think my timing is correct. Um, so at the moment we use iPhone for GPS, which is global positioning system. Tell us where to go in terms of maps. In 50 years time, GPS will mean a genomic prescribing system. On your phone, you will carry your whole human genome sequence. Uh, it will be linked to your health record in your GPs and your hospital. It will be link, linked to your laboratory tests. Your phone will not only have nine sensors, it will probably have 100 sensors. It will, it will, uh, we will uh, be able to detect everything that's happening in your body, incorporate them uh, into your phone, and the artificial intelligence algorithms will take your whole human genome, they'll take your uh, activities, what you eat, etc., cetera, um, and therefore develop the best algorithms for you so that you can actually get the best treatment. Um, and when you go to you see your doctor in 50 years time, you will just take your phone, he'll just plug it into his computer and he'll say, right, well, this is what I need to do with you. This is the best treatment for you. And that's the future of medicine. I think that we are heading there slowly. Uh, as I said, we can't fly at the moment, but in 50 years time, we will be able to fly. We can certainly walk very fast at the moment. In the near future, we'll be able to run to be able to get there. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sir Manir. That was incredibly insightful. And like you say, precision medicine, we could do a whole conference on that. And you beautifully demonstrated um, incredible examples of it in action. Um, so lots of questions coming in through the chat, but I just wanted to start off by asking precision medicine, as you've demonstrated, involves multiple disciplines. Um, how important is partnership working and collaboration, particularly between pharmacists and clinical pharmacologists for the future of precision medicine? Thank you for that question. I think it's critical. Uh, precision medicine, as I've shown you, is going to be very complicated. 
uh, is not something that one particular profession can do. So it's a multi-stakeholder partnership that is needed. Uh, pharmacists are going to be critical. Uh, you know, pharmacists run a pri you know, sort of many of the sort of primary care uh, uh, shops and so on, pharmacies, um, etc. And people will be going there uh, even before they go to general practitioners. So pharmacists are going to be critical in terms of some of the aspects of precision medicine, but also specialists in different parts of uh, hospitals are going to be important. But really, the most important partnership is going to be between the healthcare professional and the patient and the public. And that's going to be the most critical partnership as we move forward. Absolutely. Um, and second question is, there is currently a big data revolution. What are the opportunities and challenges that it poses in healthcare? Yes, there is a big data revolution. Uh, big data is everywhere. We are generating huge amounts of data every day. Um, and, and that data is going to be critical uh, in terms of uh, pro uh, progressing precision, precision medicine. Um, however, there are many challenges as well. Um, what, one of the things uh, about data is that you can have a lot of data, but if it's not good quality data, then it's not probably no use to you. We also need to develop better ways of being able to analyze that data. People talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, there is quite a lot of hype about artificial intelligence um, and it's improving all the time. So better analytical techniques will need to be developed in addition to the kind of techniques that we use at the moment. So there are many, many uh, benefits of big data, but there are also many, many challenges as well. And we need to be able to utilize all those different things that we have at the moment, develop new techniques, um, and uh, then utilize those to be able to uh, understand data better. But quality of data is really going to be important. People worry about privacy as well of their data. Um, and, and obviously it is really important to have a degree of confidentiality, privacy with regard to your data, but also it's important to, for people to think about sharing the data because they are being altruistic. And when you are altruistic like that and you get data from millions of people coming together, you can learn fantastic insights into how that data can help us to be able to treat disease. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, so there's lots of comments and questions in the chat. Um, we won't have time to address all of them, but I'm just gonna select a few. So from the chat, one of the delegates, Zara Rashid asks, um, she was interested in your slide about the Apple Watches. And her question is, how accurate are the ECGs on the Apple Watch? So the ECG is, is one lead that just comes out. When you have a normal ECG in the hospital, you have 12 leads that come out and look at different parts of your heart. Here, there's just one lead coming out. Um, and the ECG is there basically to be able to look at the rhythm. Um, and the rhythm is whether it's regular or irregular, whether you're having uh, abnormal beats or whether you have an irregular rhythm. And that is very accurate in terms of telling you that there is an irregularity in your rhythm. But the, but the watch can't tell you whether you're having an anginal attack. It can't tell you whether you're having a heart attack. So you need to be able to understand what it does tell you. Um, and, and that ECG that I showed you of mine, which was taken on my watch yesterday, shows it was a normal ECG. And I do at the moment know that I can feel my pulse, that it is, it is beating in a regular rhythm. So that was accurate. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Professor Lilani. Um, he asks, precision medicine is costly. How do you see costs decrease and make it equitable across the globe? Yes, precision medicine can be costly. It not, it's not costly all the time. It can, it can be costly. Um, and, and, you know, particularly for the, some of the new precision therapies which are coming out. And clearly that does make it uh, a challenge to be able to make sure that all the sort of, uh, populations across the globe can get it. Um, however, what we should think about is that um, what the overall cost of healthcare without precision therapies is increasing as well. And it may be, it may be that uh, what you can also do is that by using precision therapies, you can actually reduce the uh, ill health, you can reduce the uh, other aspects. Um, and therefore, in terms of cost effectiveness, it may actually be very cost effective. Um, and so, you know, so overall, even though the initial cost outlay may be high, overall in the long term, it may become quite cost effective. However, um, we do know that uh, some drugs are very expensive, uh, precision drugs. Um, and it is going to be really important to see what we can do to be able to reduce the cost of those. And I think when, at the moment, very few companies are producing these precision drugs and competition 
is what's needed and competition often drives down the cost. And as more and more people develop precision drugs, you will find that your the cost of drugs gets down because there's competition in the market and that will really be important. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Zain Kasim. Um, so I know you're heavily involved in research. So his, the question is when recruiting patients onto studies, um, they may not consent to genomic aspects due to misconceptions mainly around companies obtaining their data. How do we clear these misconceptions mis um, for the future of personalized medicine? So uh, obviously uh, it is important, as I said, for people to take part in research, but it's important that people understand why they're taking part in research and what they're, what they're providing to the researcher. So it's important to have an informed consent when you take part in research. The research should be able to tell you what's going to happen to your data. They should be able to tell you what's going to happen to your sample and to your DNA sample, for example. Um, and the DNA that you give to the, uh, to the researcher, they should be able to tell you whether they're going to share it with other researchers or with, with companies and how it's going to be used. Um, the important thing is that often when DNA is used from an individual person, uh, the individual person's DNA may not be necessarily be that important. It's a combination of DNA or from many different or thousands of people that becomes important in terms of determining whether somebody's got a disease or whether there's an increased risk of disease and so on. But obviously people are worried about their DNA and their data and they need to be aware of what they're using their DNA for or what they're using the data for. So it is really important to understand and ask the researcher questions. You know, when they are recruiting you to studies, ask them, what are you going to do with my uh, samples? What are you going to do with my data? How are you going to use it uh, to, uh, for this particular disease process that you're studying? So it is important to be able to understand and give that informed consent at the beginning. Absolutely. Um, lots of questions and comments coming in through the chat, but I think I'm just going to finish off with one last question, if I may. Um, I'm sure there are delegates, young delegates today who may be um, in the conference, you may be budding scientists, medics, allied healthcare. What is your message to them about the future of healthcare? Well, I, I think the future of healthcare is exciting. I hope I've shown you some of that, some of that and you're going to see that in other talks that you're going to listen to uh, uh, after this. Um, it is really exciting. If you are wanting to go into that, then I encourage you to go into that. Um, think about it in a positive way. Think about what, what, uh, uh, what effect you can have, not only on the small number of patients you're going to treat, but on the wider uh, global population in terms of work that you may undertake as part of research. Um, it is exciting. Uh, if, you are, if I was going to give some advice to somebody who's going into medicine at the moment, I would say really understand data. You know, become an expert in how you under, understand data. Become an expert on, uh, you know, think about how you can use information technology. And, and if you can crack those two things, then really you are going to progress through medicine very quickly in a very, very efficient way. So I, I would, that would, that's the kind of advice I would give. I would also uh, give them advice that find a mentor who can actually advise you in terms of your career progress as well. And that's going to be really important for everybody who's going into medicine. Fantastic. Um, because, so Manu, your presentation was so to time, we've actually got um, a couple more minutes for a, a few, a couple more questions, if, if we may. Um, so there's one um, comment made by Mahmoud Punja, who asks, is telemedicine the future of medicine in rural and poor countries? I think telemedicine is the future of medicine everywhere. You know, uh, during the pandemic, um, I've uh, now reverted to doing quite a lot of on, on, uh, you know, virtual clinics where I can video my, uh, you know, I can contact my patients via video or telephone rather than them coming face to face to see me in clinic. And, and uh, even in the National Health Service, which is a well-developed system, um, you know, we were doing very few uh, clinics virtually, but really in the last six months, there's been a profound change whereby a lot of clinics are now being undertaken virtually and, and telemedicine becomes really important part of that. And telemedicine will become the norm rather than the exception for the future, not only uh, in this country, but also for many rural and poor countries as well. Um, and, and, you know, so, so uh, it's some of the things that you see that's happening with specialists in, uh, you know, tertiary centers, uh, state-of-the-art centers being able to give direct advice 
to surgeons in another part, a, a rural part of another another part of another part of the world, where they can actually instruct them on what to do in a particularly complex operation that they're undertaking. Uh, this is going to become a, norm a normality rather than the exception. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, um, Sir Manir. Um, I think on that note, we're just going to thank you once again for shedding light on such an important aspect of healthcare. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are now going to admit all the delegates into your pre-selected breakout rooms. Uh, you will get an accept icon shortly before joining the room. Um, so please click the accept button when it comes on your screen. And when you are being admitted into your breakout rooms, um, please do come off video and remain on mute while being admitted to the breakout rooms. It just makes the process a little more seamless. And when the breakout room finishes, the breakout sessions are, um, have come to an end, be sure to remain online after the breakout sessions for the closing presentation on health communication. Um, so thank you all, and we'll see you after the breakout sessions. And bear with us as we admit all the delegates. I'm, I'm proud to say there's over 160 delegates in the meeting, um, so it will take us a few minutes to admit everyone. So thank you, and we'll see you very shortly. It's my absolute pleasure now um, to introduce a video by Zane Vergy. Um, she is an incredibly respected and recognized journalist with an action-packed background and experience as a storyteller, entrepreneur, communicator, and interviewer. She's well known as a former CNN anchor and correspondent and has made a successful transition into the world of communications and creative entrepreneurship. Her most recent project is a data and information site dedicated to Africa in partnership with MasterCard Foundation. Her communications firm, Zane Vergy Group, has worked with a large number of organizations and entities such as Bloomberg Media, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Equity Group Foundation of Kenya, World Health Organization, the Aga Khan Development Network, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. She is a very sought after facilitator um, and interviewer and has spoken on platforms such as TED house. She's a senior fellow at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies Africa program and she's a guest opinion columnist on African issues for the national UAE. Um, she's also a startup founder and content creator co-founding Acoma Media which is a continental network of workspaces for Africa's creative and cultural economy in 2015. And there are many other ventures that she's done as well. Um, she lives, I believe, in Los Angeles and in um, Nairobi in Kenya. And she's very kindly put together a video which um, we'll be sharing now for all the delegates. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you here today. My name is Zane Vergy. I hope you and your families are keeping safe and healthy and that you are able to cope and navigate these turbulent times. I've spent my entire career in communications, and today I'd like to take you through my personal journey and reflect at each point how the communications landscape shifted and how it will keep shifting. Before joining CNN, when I was 25 years old, I started on-air life as a radio DJ in Nairobi. Lots of fun. I hosted The Love Show and played music and offered bad romantic advice. After joining a local TV station called Kenya Television Network, I came to truly understand the power of being on the air and the importance of having a singular, crisp and clear message, one that connected to people. I enjoyed having a large audience at the time because there was very limited TV competition and no social media. <laughs> I wasn't competing with Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. A global journalism career began when I moved to Atlanta to work for CNN. I covered some major stories from the anchor desk, and I learned many things. That stories are decided through newsworthiness, yes, but also through pictures, characters, and uniqueness, and that a connection and an emotion must be delivered. I learned too that less words are more. I learned to truly listen. And I also discovered that press releases are not ever really read. 
The buzz of a newsroom and breaking news was very exciting, and I truly immersed myself in stories of the day. Many years later, I transferred to being a field reporter when I covered US foreign policy from the State Department in Washington, DC. That was when Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State. I traveled the world in her plane with my producer here, Elise Labatt. It was an amazing experience. Secretary Rice's press corps, by the way, was almost entirely female, and we called ourselves the Diplo Babes. I reported daily on Wolf Blitzer's show called The Situation Room, analyzing and reporting the foreign policy news of that day. I learned so much about beat reporting and how sources are managed and developed and ultimately used to break or to confirm news. I saw firsthand how the daily briefing at the State Department in Washington could actually resonate around the world. I observed how pitches coming into my inbox would generate editorial interest if they had a news hook. Health Beats operated in similar ways and were actually much more siloed because they're considered feature stories that occasionally make the news cycle. At the time, health was not a national security issue. It's very different right now. From Washington, I moved to London and I hosted the Europe Morning Shows, which was exciting. I met the Queen and I also hosted many shows from Africa. And it was here I discovered that there were so many important stories that needed to be told on the continent and no international media was really doing it well, or if they were doing it, it was kind of stereotypical. And I felt that Africa had more edge, more nuance, more dynamism, and that was not being reflected. And I wanted to do something about it. So I left CNN and I built a media startup called Akoma with my co-founder, Chidi Afulezi. It was a digital platform where Africans could come and tell authentic and compelling stories that truly reflected the diversity and the richness of the continent. One of our big successes was Amplify, a creative content and talent accelerator where creatives from various countries came together in cohorts to learn and to collaborate on stories. A coma unfortunately failed. You know, doing business in Africa is pretty tough. I discovered there are 54 countries, a multitude of languages, uh, various media ecosystems that add a, a real level of complexity that is actually quite challenging. But from a communication standpoint, I learned the following from my Acoma experiences, and I'd really love to share those with you. First of all, the most important person in Africa is the storyteller. The most important person on any continent is the storyteller because it's the young talent that have the smartphones and that are crazy creative and they need to be used. They're not used enough. I also discovered that local content creation is a lot cheaper and a lot more authentic. And that coupled with training can improve the quality of content and local messaging that you need. The creative and cultural industries essentially can project soft power of the continent if they're deployed correctly. And there remains much work to be done in this space in the CCIs as they're known in order to make them more effective. After a coma, I created Zane Vergy Group. We're a global media advisory firm specializing in emerging markets. And I work with countries and corporates and foundations, as well as creatives, to put on some pretty cool events, such as Rouse and Fearless Women. One of my early projects was to take a detailed look at global health communications. Dr. Tedros, at the time, had just taken over as Director General of the World Health Organization. And I spent some time looking at the nitty gritty of health communications at the very highest levels in Geneva. And it was clear that tech platforms, data analysis, um, distilling information into understandable formats for different audiences was absolutely crucial. And there was a lot of work being done around this space, which has proven very helpful now. 
because then COVID hit. And global health was no longer a siloed issue. It was a global security issue, an economic and a social priority as well. So what communications lessons did I learn over the last few months from observing what was going on around us? First of all, clear and efficient messaging was critical. Wear a mask, wash your hands, get tested, stay six feet apart. The simpler the communications, the better. No technical jargon, no politics. Sitting here in the United States, I can tell you firsthand what politics does to messaging. Transparency was important. Say what you know, say what you don't know. It's okay, build trust with the audience. Of course, storytelling. Where there were individual opportunities to tell stories, be they of triumph, of sorrow, of recovery, whether they were cautionary stories, stories of impact, of breakthrough, of communities rallying around one another, all of these resonated. It made the COVID pandemic real. Remember how Tom Hanks and his wife uh, reported very early on that they had COVID? The message there was, if those celebrities have it, then perhaps I am vulnerable. Perhaps I can get it too. Remember the stories, for example, in Italy and all those performances of music and, and opera on balconies. Look at how the NBA and the football leagues have actually employed and leveraged science and ensured experts helped them navigate this turbulent environment safely. One of the greatest communications challenges have to point out, and you know, has been how to deal with the infodemic, how to deal with fake news and incorrect facts and information. One of the ways that has worked really well uh, has been through health entertainment. And really consider what's happened here. When you look at things like memes or animations or videos, they have had a significant impact and have gained a lot more prominence. When you use content creators, this has proved, in this pandemic, a powerful tool because creativity is key in engaging people. When you've got clever memes or entertaining videos that communicate key messages and address the stigma, the fear, and the paranoia, it reaches people, right? There were many videos that were instructional that I saw that were funny and quirky and clever in sound and design, but they got the message across. And that is what we need to do. Data and dashboards were something else to take note of. They were an immediate communications need. And I want to highlight one person that did an incredible job. A 17-year-old kid, he's a coder, his name is Avi Schiffman. He became one of the key providers of information on COVID-19 very early on. He stepped up and he delivered right away on what people were looking for. He created this dashboard using a very simple web scraping tool, which, and by the way, he originally built it to track sports stats at his high school. And he applied that at the beginning of the pandemic to aggregate data from various national health agency sites. This is what technology helped to do. Avi became the center of gravity in the United States, and this was his site. From my work in Africa, Julie Gishuru reached out to me. She's the head of communications with the MasterCard Foundation. And back in March, we had a conversation and we discussed the vision that she had behind building a digital platform that would capture the stats and information, the numbers, some analysis that really told the COVID story in Africa. And she requested that we explore the development of our own dedicated dashboard for COVID-19 data and information and stories dedicated to Africa. And that's what we did. This is covidhqafrica.com. Please go check it out. The goal was to generate a platform like this that was high-end and that showed Africa's design and product prowess and made sure that the information was presented in a delightful and useful way to the African community and reflected their continent back to them. This was the dashboard. My business partner, Chidi, is actually, unfortunately for me, one of the best product guys out there. 
And together we built this website. And we, it also demonstrated to us that the WHO relationships that I had in the past came into play because we were able to use their data and receive their encouragement and support for an initiative like this. Our development partners also came up with useful bots and data visualizations like this and more that we've got in the pipeline that have really resonated. In our work on the continent, what we want to do at the same time is to leverage the individual creator, like I've been saying, to share messages online and on mobile. Watch this. Everything's over the same idea. The quad won't tell me some fish mass. The health is well tied here. I know that the weather's not open. The can't be so complacent. It's kind of boring. It's up to us. It's up to us. The Up To Us campaign is running uh, continent-wide, and this was a video in Ghana. So this is part of a hyper-local content strategy that we're building that truly leans on creators to communicate messages that are identifiable, that resonate in their communities, in their countries, and their own languages. The old school works too. It doesn't always have to be high tech, okay? We've used local messaging on popular motorbikes in Kenya called Bora Boras, like this. As you can see, we have a jacket there, wear a mask, has the website there, and uh, people go around motorbikes uh, across Nairobi and, and other parts of the continent with messages like this. Billboards work as well. Right, So it's important to look at things like radio messages that have been very effective in local language campaigns that we've done. We've also worked with an intelligence-driven company that created a dashboard for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, as well as Africa CDC, that really informed us on conversations that people were having on social media about things like COVID, infection, symptoms, food prices, domestic violence. We took these keywords and we were able to map key themes and gain some pretty valuable insights into what people were saying in the cities and towns that they lived in. And we were able to prioritize information. I hope sharing my stories and experiences has been helpful to you today. As we move through the pandemic and we look beyond it, it's absolutely clear that communications is no longer a soft aspect of executing on big projects. It's critical, it's central. We now see the development of health apps where Apple and Google, for instance, are inserting themselves into health communications. WHO and CDC are doing some very smart integrations that give them immediate access to health information and analysis. We have to keep finding more ways, be more innovative in how we put out positive messages from trusted sources. We need to train more journalists on things like vaccines or gender issues, for example. And we have to make people more vigilant about what it is they are reading, what it is they are learning and absorbing. Diseases are now being considered a global security issue something very different today. Risks of pandemics are higher now than a nuclear war. So it's imperative that countries, organizations, and individuals put time and energy into truly embracing health communications. And importantly, in investing in bold new ways to do messaging. Thank you. Thank you all and thank you Zane for that. Um, we're just going to go for our second round of poll questions now, um, which you'll shortly get up on your screen. So again, a couple of questions if you can please answer. I feel I have a better understanding of the future challenges and opportunities in the healthcare sector. One strongly disagree, five strongly agree. And second question, I feel hopeful about the future of healthcare. One, not hopeful at all, and five, very hopeful. So yeah, so we can see here that um, most people seem to have a better understanding of the future challenges and opportunities in the healthcare sector, which is, which is great. And people, I feel, are either ambivalent or cautiously optimistic about the future of healthcare, um, which is definitely um, a start in the right direction. 
Um, all that really remains for us to say is um, a huge thank you to all of our speakers and to all of you today for joining us on this um, rainy Sunday afternoon. In a time where health is at the forefront of people's mind, today has provided the perfect platform for us to explore and discuss what the future of healthcare holds and how this can and will impact on us as individuals. There is no doubt that coronavirus remains at the forefront of everybody's minds, but for me, there are a few areas of healthcare which I am particularly excited about. As was mentioned earlier, with the growth of wearable technology and remote monitoring, there will be greater emphasis on gathering and analyzing large amounts of data. This will support more personalized medicine where treatment can be individually tailored to the patient. Nanotechnology, which I'm not sure was discussed, was an, is another area that is particularly exciting. Um, nanoscience is a relatively new field um, that studies materials at the nanoscale. Um, and it has the potential to tra transform current chemo chemotherapy treatments um, with nanostructures being loaded with chemotherapy drugs to selectively target cancer cells, um, which would give the benefit of chemotherapy without any of the side effects. We've discussed that with precision medicine, it can help with the early detection and prevention of disease. And this is in line, particularly with the health board's aims and priorities for non-communicable disease, um, and is so particularly very relevant. Um, we hope you've all come away from today with some additional knowledge and information about physical and mental health. And I hope that you're as excited as I am about what the future of healthcare holds for us all. So thank you all very much for joining. If anyone has any questions um, or comments, please do put it in the chat um, and we look forward to seeing you all very soon again. Thank you.